horrific experiences of Jackie Hernandez stand as an unparalleled testament to the depths of paranormal terror, widely regarded as one of the most unnerving and unexplainable cases ever investigated. The events that unfolded within Jackie's San Pedro home are etched in chilling detail, defying any rational explanation. In November of 1988, Jackie Hernandez made the life-changing decision to move to San Pedro, California, amidst a rocky marriage with her soon-to-be ex-husband, Al. Accompanied by her two-year-old son, Jamie, and pregnant with her second child, she saw San Pedro as an opportunity for a fresh beginning. The small and rather endearing bungalow on 11th Street appeared to be an ideal choice for the single mother. However, life wasn't at all easy for Jackie. She was juggling multiple responsibilities, working tirelessly to make ends meet, attending classes, and navigating the stress of a deteriorating marriage all while anticipating the arrival of her daughter. Nonetheless, Jackie was determined to establish a good household for her children. Almost immediately after Jackie and her son began to settle into their new surroundings, Jackie started sensing some type of presence in the home. Despite this, she didn't believe it haunted, and she didn't jump to any premature conclusions. After all, she was undergoing stress and all the strange effects that came with pregnancy. With no evidence or noticeable activity, she dismissed the notion, yet she still wondered where the odd feelings were coming from. After all, Jackie did have a fear of being alone, but it never stemmed from ghosts or anything of that nature. Instead, it was over potential break-ins and the safety of her household. Even with that thought and the feelings of a presence, she felt relatively safe and overall wasn't afraid. This allowed for her to put it off to the side and just accept things were going well, until they weren't. Some time after Jackie moved in, her ex-husband, from whom she was separated with at the time, experienced an unfortunate incident when he lost his house to a fire. Jackie agreed to let Al temporarily stay with her for about a week. It was during this period that the first of many unsettling events had occurred. It was during a quiet evening, as Jackie, Al, and one of Jackie's friends were at her San Pedro home. While Jackie was passing by her desk where Al was seated, a pencil holder suddenly tumbled off the desk and right in her direction, scattering its contents across the floor. Both Jackie and Al exchanged looks, unable to understand how it even happened. Jackie was several feet away, Al was not within arm's reach of the pencil holder, and her friend remained on the living room couch. Despite their confusion, Jackie initially dismissed the incident as it was something small and easy to shrug off. But unknown at the time, these occurrences not only became more frequent, but also worsened, slowly, at first. It began with the strange noises in the walls, which Jackie first assumed might be mice or some other small animal. But then there came the muffled voices in the attic, a daybed in the home that would randomly collapse without any reason to, strange low hums from the laundry room, and the family cat, who was very mellow, suddenly becoming frantic. It would run around the house as if chasing something across the walls, sometimes arching its back in defense, as if frightened by an unseen presence. It wasn't until five months later in April of 1989, after Jackie gave birth to her daughter, Samantha, that things really took a detrimental turn. The activity in the house increased even more than expected. Orbs, strange mists, voices, unpleasant smells, sounds of raspy, labored breathing. Jackie and her good friend, also occasional babysitter, Christina Zivkovic, who went by Chrissy, were in the kitchen washing dishes together one day when the walls in that area started to ooze an odd substance. This water-like liquid, sometimes appearing in small puddles or droplets, was amber in color and emitted a very distasteful smell it would later be seen seeping out of light fixtures 
and even the ceilings. Then there were the odd awakenings. Jackie began to notice how every night she would awaken at exactly midnight, no matter what time she went to sleep. Often this would be due to a very disturbing and repetitive dream. It was so vivid to her that she could recall the exact sequence. In the dream, there was a young man standing in the San Pedro Harbor. She described the setting to be that of the 1930s. In this dream, the man was seen meeting his unfortunate demise. There were even times where these nightmares would put Jackie in the place of this stranger, as if forcing her to relive the experience. Being clubbed by a lead pipe, and then held under the water to drown as the vision slowly blurred. During every time she awoke, something subtle yet out of the ordinary would happen. Eventually, this would intensify until the presence Jackie had felt from day one was revealed. Jackie once again woke up right on cue as the clock struck midnight. Now, since she was awake, she decided to get up to use the restroom. In order to get to it, she had to cross the bedroom in which was dimly illuminated by a warm light that she kept on at nights in the closet. Something done by habit and somewhat of a safety measure. As she made her way, she noticed a solid figure out of the corner of her eye. This apparition was in no way transparent. Noticing this, she instinctively snapped her head in its direction. There on her son's bunk bed sat a bony man with an unmistakably corpse-like appearance. He wore a faded red flannel, gray pants, and workman's boots. Jackie described his skin as being grayish in tone, and his face was contorted in an angry and very evil expression. This figure glared at her for a couple of seconds before completely blinking away and out of existence. Unfortunately for Jackie, this was not the only entity that would make itself known. As a little time passed, Jackie was told by one of her friends that they had accidentally stumbled upon some money in the attic of their old home, most likely left by a previous tenant. As Jackie and Chrissy sat in Jackie's house one day, the thought of it randomly came to mind. Jackie owned an old home too and decided to check the attic just out of curiosity. Climbing atop the washing machine to reach the narrow attic door, she pushed it open and peered into the darkness. A palpable sense of being watched instantly overwhelmed her, the feeling emanating from somewhere behind where she was facing. With a growing sense of unease, Jackie turned slightly, only to encounter a disembodied head which was floating in one of the back corners of her attic. Startled and paralyzed by fear, Jackie tumbled from the washing machine as her legs completely gave out underneath her, leaving Chrissy to witness her friend's panicked state. Another occurrence involved a picture that had fallen from the wall. Although this picture wasn't simply hanging, it had been attached to the wall with two smaller sized nails. When Jackie and her neighbor, Susan Castaneda, were in the home one day, the two of them heard a noise coming from around the kitchen area. As they made their way to the source, they noticed the picture lying flat on the ground. Now at first it may not seem like much, maybe the nails had come loose or something of the sort, but if that was the case, the two nails would have simply dropped or even scattered. However. The two nails were on a table, perfectly side by side, standing upright on their head, point up. Going back a bit, it's important to note that throughout these events, a couple of Jackie's friends, including her babysitter, Tina, and her next door neighbor, as mentioned previously, Susan Castaneda, had started experiencing some of the more milder occurrences in the home. Initially, these were limited to sounds, doors opening, and occasional glimpses of a strange light. However, Susan remained somewhat skeptical. She often went over to comfort Jackie, but Susan considered some of the claims to be a bit over-exaggerated, 
refusing to believe in anything sinister or otherworldly in just yet, due to her not really seeing anything. However, her skepticism waned as the phenomena intensified, leading to an encounter of her own. One night as she lay in bed, and the sounds of rain pattered against her window, she awoke to a very loud thud. At first figuring it may have been the storm outside, she sat up in panic wondering what it was. That's when she noticed her antique alarm clock had flown off the nightstand and was now lying on the floor in the middle of her bedroom. It had broken into many pieces. During this find is when she noticed the same corpse-like figure Jackie had described, only now it was standing in her own home, in her room. It had an awful, rotten smell, and only remained for a split second before vanishing. Although Susan still couldn't make sense of what it was, she stated, and I quote, It did things here at my house to let me know that it was here. Jackie really had no one she fully felt comfortable to confide in or vent to. That is, no one other than her ex-husband, Al, in whom she eventually relayed all of the events to. She even showed him a picture of one of the floating lights in the house she just so happened to capture on camera. Al sort of figured this was Jackie's way of seeking attention, or maybe she just missed his company. Due to that, Al still heard her out, but took everything she said with a grain of salt. Eventually, he went to the San Pedro home to visit Jackie, giving her a shoulder and support as she went through all of these disturbing experiences. There was a day at the house where Al declared, if there was truly something amiss, the entity clearly needed to be called out. Jackie insisted that Al refrain from doing so, telling him it wasn't a good idea. Yet Al continued, and spoke out for the presence to make itself known. A few minutes of heartbeat silence go by, and finally Al says, See? There's nothing there. He proceeds to walk into another room, and Jackie heads to her closet to put something away. When she opens the door and turns on the light, written all over every wall inside the closet is Al's name. The A in blue, the L in red. Jackie believed without a doubt that this was a response to Al provoking the entity. The activity in Jackie's home gradually began to take over her life and sense of well-being. Being a single mother with two children, she didn't have the resources to just up and leave. She was becoming more and more paranoid and was too terrified to tell the local authorities in fear of being seen as an unfit mother. She had even moved her kids and herself to all sleep in the same room right by the door, in case they needed to run. She was overworked, she was tired, she was stressed. Having to deal with incident after incident, she began to question her own sanity. She had others question her sanity, and at one point, was even being investigated by CPS once the word began to get out and claims of her house being haunted were surfacing. Susan had brought up the incidents to Jackie's landlord, which resulted in his advice to get the place cleansed. Although Jackie followed through, the priest who had entered her home proved to be less than helpful, in the end claiming she was merely possessed. From being drug tested, to being accused of using hallucinogens while pregnant, to apparently being possessed, all help seemed to attack Jackie more than aid, leaving her feeling trapped with the torments of her hauntings. Seeing the desperation and seriousness of Jackie's ever-growing situation, Susan had turned to a paranormal investigative team she saw on TV. The team was led by Dr. Barry Taff, a world-renowned parapsychologist who had one of his cases gain international fame in 1974. It was turned into both a book and a motion picture known as The Entity. At that time, Taff had already worked on around 3,000 paranormal cases over the last 25 years, most of which he explained were duds due to fabrication, invention, and exaggeration, 
unfortunately turning them into complete frauds. Because of this, Taft stated that most cases weren't even worth pursuing, and others in the end had rational explanations. However, when Jackie's ordeal was brought to his attention, Taft's interest was instantly piqued. It was later that year, August 8th, 1989, when Taft and three other investigators first entered Jackie Hernandez's San Pedro home. Taft was first to arrive, soon followed by Barry Conrad, a cinematographer and producer, Jeff Wheatcraft, a professional photographer, and Larry Brooks, an illustrator. When the team got inside and began interviewing and prepping, there seemed to be a mix of emotions among them. Barry Conrad was described as excited as a kid on Christmas to capture anything of significance, while Jeff Wheatcraft was, quote, very doubtful. In fact, pretty much all of them were initially skeptical. However, one thing to note is the team all experienced a strange pressure around their ears when stepping foot on the property. After some questions toward Jackie had been covered, pictures had been taken around areas of said activity, and drawings were in the process of being sketched. Jeff soon navigated toward the attic where Jackie had seen the disembodied head. As he stood on the washing machine and peered in just as Jackie had done, he initially didn't experience anything, but there was an undoubtable sense of unease. Once again, just like Jackie, he said that he felt as if something from behind him was watching, but nothing else worth mentioning. He snapped a few pictures in the direction he was facing, and then descended back to the others. After describing what he felt, one of the other men suggested he go back up and try to snap some pictures behind him. Basically, Jeff would have to turn his arm, angling the camera back behind him as he took the photos. He agreed, and went back to the attic to do so. Now, during this time, Al was also present in the home. He would be watching and taking care of the kids while the others went about the investigation. This is where two events take place that seem to coordinate with each other. Jeff is on his way back up to the attic, and at the same time, Al is sitting on the couch with the kids. All the while, not thinking anything is going to come of this, he's sort of off in his own world and just letting the time pass while they do their thing. That's when he hears a very distinct voice off to the side of him say, Tell them to get the hell out of here. Without even thinking, he sort of responds that he can't. It's not his home, so he has no right to do so. That's when he realizes there's no one actually there. It was immediately after Al heard these words that a loud scream could be heard from Jeff up in the attic. Seconds later, he practically face plants from the narrow hatch, and everyone anxiously asked him what happened. As Jeff was in the attic snapping pictures behind him, he said that on the third shot, his camera was quickly yanked from his hands. It was as if someone grabbed it by the lens and angrily snatched it from him. In a panic-induced surge of adrenaline, Jeff and Barry Conrad fully ascended the attic in attempts to retrieve the precious equipment and get more evidence. This time, they went up with flashlights and a 1,000-watt light. When they discovered the camera, the lens was found in one corner of the attic, while the body had been neatly placed upside down in an old crate on the complete opposite side, about 15 to 20 feet away. The lens and camera body couldn't simply be detached. It was stated that someone who wanted to separate them needed to have some kind of knowledge on cameras, as there's a friction mount lock bounding the lens and body together. The team tried to rationalize what could have caused that. There was no one physically up there. It was a small attic, and by now it would have been apparent if Jackie had set something up for this to be a staged hoax. More events took place that night, from equipment completely losing power when utilized only up in the attic, a small cone of bright light being caught on still image, heavy footsteps, and a large black mass seen by Jeff Wheatcraft, which he described as soundlessly and slowly gliding across the darkness of the attic before dissipating. Jeff had also been gradually yet aggressively pushed 
by what he said felt like a very large and bony hand on his back. Barry Conrad was in the attic with Jeff at the time this happened, and said he could see him being pushed forward as a horrified expression grew across his face. After enduring these events on their very first night, the investigative team, to both Jackie and Al's surprise, ended up gathering their things and booking it out of the home, leaving Al feeling uneasy and Jackie sobbing as she was desperate for help. Now she just felt abandoned, as if the paranormal team only angered the presence more. Several weeks later, early September 1989, Barry Conrad would receive a series of calls over a short period from Jackie Hernandez. In one voicemail, Jackie claimed that the entity had attempted to kill her. She had proclaimed the figure of what appeared to be a very angry old man, loomed over her sleeping children one night, watching them. During another night, Jackie awoke, unable to breathe, move, or even see as an unseen force covered her face as if attempting to smother her. When the struggle finally ceased, nothing was in the room with her. Feeling for Jackie's horrible and plummeting state, Barry, Jeff, and another member, Gary Boehm, made their way back to the bungalow late one night. This visit would serve as a treasure trove for activity, as well as the last time the team would ever step foot inside Jackie's home. Jackie's growing fear for her children, and rapidly waning desire to make it out, seemed to play a huge factor in these happenings. During this final investigation, the attic was once again the hot spot for the team. However, as they ascended, everything was calm and quiet. No noises, no movement, no physical contact. This made everyone feel extremely uneasy. Jackie and Barry were on the main floor while Jeff and Gary were in the attic. Jeff had taken up a flashlight, and Gary had taken up a camera. A few moments go by when three consecutive and distinct snaps can be heard from within the attic. At the same time, Jackie feels an awful wave of dread and panic wash over her as she and Barry start to tell the two in the attic to promptly return down. As Gary and Jeff begin to do so, Jeff is once again attacked. Something seems to pull Jeff back into the attic, and before Gary goes down, he begins frantically snapping pictures for some source of light. Since Jeff carried the flashlight, he had no other way to see. It's at this moment he can barely make out the faint outline of Jeff, who looks like he's floating against one of the rafters in the small attic. Whatever this thing was, it had placed a rope around Jeff's neck and attempted to hang him from a nail that was protruding from the roof supports. It was unlike anything they had ever seen. As Jeff was fighting to breathe by pushing against a beam, Gary ran to his aid and the two scrambled back to the ground, leaving the attic and the home never to return. Since these traumatic hauntings, Jackie had temporarily moved in with a friend, only returning to the house on the weekends to retrieve any belongings she may have needed. In that same fall of 1989, Jackie and Al eventually moved together from San Pedro. Both of them had hopes to start again, escaping the tragedy and rekindling their marriage in a remote location of Weldon, California, located in Kern County. However, it wasn't long until after settling in, that Jackie had once again begun to see the ghostly man from her San Pedro home. Although these incidents were becoming less and less frequent, until finally around the year 1990, they completely ceased. There are many opinions and theories when it comes to this case, from Jackie's stress and emotional issues she was facing, to even the romantic feelings she had developed toward Barry Conrad at the time. Regardless, this case proves to be extremely intriguing with the photo and video evidence that was caught during the investigations. Jackie was able to escape the depths of this paranormal torment, allowing her to regain her peace of mind over time. I'd like to know about your opinions on this case, thoughts on the events and what you believe may have been happening. 
In the face of uncertainty, it is our courage to confront the mysteries that define us, guiding us ever onward into the realms of possibility and the unknown.